Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship here at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you are worshiping with us today, and we pray that God is going to meet you in this time. We would love the chance to get to connect with you, to know that you're here and worshiping with us. So if you would take a moment and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and also let us know how we can be praying for you this week. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer for this season of Lent. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Merciful God, search us and know us. In this season of Lent, grant us courage to take honest stock of ourselves and acknowledge our wrongdoings. Jesus, as we walk with you towards the cross, take away our bent to sinning and teach us how to live. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning, Church. I'm Eun Siu Kang, one of the associate pastors here. It is my great joy to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, thank you for inviting us to worship and praise. Thank you for saving us and making us whole. Thank you for calling us to goodness and grace. We thank you for the gift of this new day to be renewed in your spirit and your words. As you have taught us, we want to fill this day with opportunities to show kindness, compassion, and understanding to one another. Grant us the wisdom to see the humanity in each person we encounter, to recognize their dignity as your beloved children. In our interactions with one another, may we be guided by empathy and respect, seeking to build bridges of understanding rather than walls of division. May we be vessels of your peace, spreading love and goodwill wherever we go. Help us to listen with open heart. Give us the strength to put others before ourselves 
and to treat others as we would wish to be treated. Give us your heart to cry for others and pray for others, not just for ourselves and our family. So we lift up to you, O Lord, those who need your hands in your comfort. We ask your peace for those who are experiencing times of difficulty, especially for Israel and Gaza. And now we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your strength and comfort. Touch their lives and souls with your warm hands. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift. As we respond to God's generosity and grace, I'd like to remind you that you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website and by mail. Let us continue to worship our God. I'm Pastor Eun Seo. I'm so excited to share this time with you all. So today, I brought my friend with me. Do you remember my friend Miki last time I introduced him to you all? So Miki loves to learn about new things, especially about how to be a good friend. Um, but sometimes he gets a little confused, especially when he plays with his girlfriend, Minnie. So I want to ask your help. Do you think you can help him out? Okay, good, thank you. So today we're talking about something special called golden rule. Have you ever heard of that? It is a rule and that Jesus taught us and it is really, really easy to understand. Jesus said, do to others what you would like them to do to you. That means if you want someone to be kind to you, you should be kind to them. And if you want someone to share with you, you should share with them. So it is like treating others the way you want it to be treated. So now let us, some think, about, let us think about some examples. Imagine if you had um, a favorite toy and you didn't want anyone break it. How would you treat someone else's favorite toy? Yeah, absolutely. You would treat uh, someone else's favorite toys very carefully and nicely, just as you would like someone to treat your favorite toys. And what if you were feeling sad? How would you like someone to help you feel better? Yeah, right. Absolutely, you would want someone to comfort you and listen to you. So if you see someone else feeling sad, how could you help them to feel better? Yeah, you could give them a hug and talk to them and also give some sweet words and kind words. So by doing these things, you are following the golden rules. You are treating others the way you want it to be treated. So this week, let us remember you treat others with kindness and respect and love, just like Jesus taught us. So let us ask God to give us his wisdom through our prayer. Let us pray. 
Dear God, thank you for giving us important lesson today. Help us to treat others with love and compassion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for helping Miki to learn about this important lesson. Good morning, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Our sermon series uh, continues to look at uh, distortions of what God intended for us. Uh, another way of looking at that is the result of sin in the world. And so uh, throughout the season of Lent, uh, we're looking at different problems that occur, and today's problem is uh, in relationships between two people. And so we're looking uh, specifically in Genesis chapter 16 uh, about a very tense relationship between um, Sarah, who was married to Abram. This is before uh, he takes the name Abraham, and actually she goes by the name Sarai, S-A-R-A-I. Um, and the relationship between Sarai and her maidservant or slave girl, depending on the translation, um, Hagar. And so let's, uh, let's pick this up in Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl's in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you've conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord, shoot, yes, so she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are Elroy, for she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Be'er Lehi Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him, Ishmael. This, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, you created us to be in a loving relationship with you and to have meaningful relationships with others. Lord, I pray that um, we would begin to treat each other well. Lord, speak to us. Teach us how to do this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at the first of the year, we began a series entitled, Who Am I? Each week, we heard a different sermon about what God intended for people. Then as we started the season of Lent, we began to look at how sin has messed up what God intended. So for instance, we learned in January that God is our creator and that God created us to be in relationship or communion with Him. But in February, we heard the story of the Tower of Babel, where people thought they could get along without God, that they were just as powerful as God, and that they could get to heaven without God. Back in January, we learned that the first commandment was to take care of the earth. And in March, we learn that God will take care of all our needs, just as He did by giving the Hebrew people manna in the wilderness. Nevertheless, 
the people grumbled when they couldn't have more than what they needed, which shows that part of the human condition is that we want more than our share and that taking more than our share leads to abuse of the earth's resources. In January, we learned that God intended for people to work and that they would find dignity in using their abilities to provide for their families and make the world a better place. And yet, last week, we learned that people often make an idol of their work and place their work ahead of their relationship with God and with others. Today, we're looking at another result of the fact we live in a fallen world. God intended for us to have meaningful relationships. But in today's story, we learn that people sometimes take advantage of others due to their own selfishness. So let's dive in. You may recall that Jesus reduced all the commandments down to just two. We are to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves. It isn't so hard to love a God who's good and values us highly. However, when we begin to love others as we love ourselves, that's not quite as easy. Some people are just plain hard to love. They aren't nearly as good as God, and they sure don't value us highly enough to die for us. It probably doesn't take you very long to think of a person in your life who is difficult to love. But it may surprise you to know how much the Bible has to say about difficult relationships. Let's look in on some difficult people. If ever there was a family exhibiting difficult behavior, it's the family of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And for our purposes today, we're highlighting Abraham, his wife Sarai, and her maidservant Hagar. Which one of the three people in the passage I just read would we describe as the difficult one? Case could be made for all three of them. Abram, Sarai, and Hagar all exhibited difficult behavior at some point in the passage, but it would not be fair to label them all as difficult people. Labeling people as difficult too quickly might be inaccurate, and it doesn't allow people a chance to change. It may also cause us to write them off. We may miss the opportunity to know a wonderful person or to appreciate the good things that they're able to provide for us or for others. King David, for instance, would not be considered a difficult person by most people, but Uriah's family might say otherwise. After all, David stole Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and then had Uriah killed. And yet David was extremely popular, widely considered Israel's greatest king. The Bible even calls him a man after God's own heart. Now that may be an extreme example, but the fact is all of us exhibit difficult behavior to someone at some time. Let's review today's story to help us understand the problem. Abraham and Sarah have been promised a child by God, but they're getting on up there in age and still no baby. So Sarah decides not to wait on God any longer and instead take matters into her own hands by saying to her husband, why don't you take my slave girl Hagar as your wife and perhaps we can have an heir through her. Abraham says, okay, because that wasn't that weird back then. And sure enough, Hagar becomes pregnant. Instead of celebrating this scheme, working out just as Sarah had imagined, she now gets jealous that Hagar was able to conceive when she was not. So she begins to mistreat Hagar and is so horrible to her that Hagar runs away. While Hagar is running, she stops at a spring for a drink. And there an angel of the Lord tells her that God has seen her and that she is to go back to her mistress, Hagar, excuse me, Sarai. Her reward will be that God will so greatly multiply her offspring that they will not be able to be counted. Not an easy thing for Hagar to do, but she turns around and goes back home. In this passage, Sarai was difficult to Hagar, and Sarai interpreted Hagar's actions as difficult in return. It all comes down to how you see it. I'm sure Sarai thought Hagar was the difficult one and not herself. On the other hand, it's obvious that Hagar thought Sarai was being difficult and that she was only an innocent victim. Two people can experience the same event, but they may experience it very differently. This is because we view everything through the filter of our own experiences. And we choose the stories we tell ourselves about the facts of our lives. In my family growing up, I always thought my sister was favored because she was the youngest. But she would probably say that she thought I was the favored one by mom and dad. 
I guess our parents must have done a good job of being fair because both of us thought the other was favored. And I'm sure I'll get a text from her about this later today. You see, we both experienced the same events, but we perceived them differently. This is why even Jesus could be viewed by some as a difficult person. He was perfect. But I'm sure the money changers in the temple that he drove out thought he was difficult. And the religious leaders who thought he was blaspheming by healing on the Sabbath would have found him difficult too. It was easy for Sarai to see the difficult behavior exhibited by Hagar, but I doubt if she ever saw it in herself. Hagar, on the other hand, saw difficult behavior coming out of Sarai, but would not have seen her participation in this plan as contributing to the problem. This is why in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus can talk about a person seeing a speck in someone else's eye, but failing to see the log in their own. We will judge whether a person is difficult or not by how they treat us. And generally speaking, we don't treat all people the same. So although Abram and Sarai may have said that Hagar was being difficult, I doubt she'd agree. And I'm sure Hagar and Abram's son, Ishmael, wouldn't agree either. His experience with his mom was probably a very positive one. And so his opinion of her is very different from Sarai's. In the same way, we usually determine our estimation of a person primarily by our interaction with them. I'm sure Joseph from the Old Testament didn't think that his father Jacob was being difficult when he showed favoritism to him. The other brothers, though, viewed their father's favoring of Joseph as very difficult. And so their decision to sell him reflects their hostility toward their father and toward Joseph. So in preparation for this sermon, I started thinking, maybe I'm a difficult person. How can I find out? I could go around asking people, but they're probably going to tell me what I want to hear. So I took a test. The Individual Differences Research Lab actually has a test to determine how difficult you are. The test has 35 questions, and it doesn't take too long, so I gave it a try. I scored in the easy-to-get-along-with zone. Shoo! But I didn't get an absolute zero on the difficulty scale. I scored a 24 out of 100. And I'm sure there are people in this room, my family, and my staff who'd like for me to retake that test. I scored the lowest or best in the areas of risk-taking and callousness. I scored the highest or worst in grandiosity and aggressiveness. I'm not so surprised about the grandiosity. After all, I do have an ego. But I was a little surprised about the aggressiveness. The three categories that I scored in the middle on were suspiciousness, manipulation, and domineering. How do you think you would do? There's another test you can take, if you like, from the University of California. It's titled, Am I a Jerk? Why would anyone want to take this test? Well, according to Eric Schwitzgable, a professor at the University of California, Riverside, jerk self-knowledge is hard to come by. Schwitzgable defines a jerk as someone who culpably fails to appreciate the perspectives of others around him, treating them as tools to be manipulated or fools to be dealt with, rather than as moral peers. The jerk faces special obstacles to self-knowledge of his own moral character, partly because of his disregard of the opinions of people who could give him useful critical feedback. So if you're not willing to listen to others who could give you useful critical feedback, then you might want to take this test to check against what Professor Switch Gable calls your jerkitude. You can easily find that test online. But instead of the internet or the realm of academics, our primary authority is the Bible. So let's check out some examples of how to deal with difficult people from the Word of God. Number one, believe the best about people. The famous love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, says, Love believes all things. This does not mean... To love, you have to believe everything you're told, but it means you should believe the best about a person until you absolutely have to believe otherwise. It is placing a good motive behind people's actions or refusing to believe bad things about them until it is absolutely certain. Don't jump to conclusions or suspicions about people. 
Even if something looks fishy, it's possible the person has a good reason or motive for doing it. For instance, every Methodist minister knows that when it's time to move to a new church, the best place to get moving boxes from is the liquor store. I've even had a box of books in my office for the last nine years that has a whiskey brand on the side of the box. Now, I don't even drink. I just happen to know where to get good boxes. Number two, overcome evil with good. This is from Romans 12. This particular model is seen in many places in the Bible and exemplified by Jesus during his trial. When someone does something hurtful to you, this model says you don't do anything hurtful in return, but instead you do something good to them. Jesus said even people of the world are good to those who are good to them, but he called his followers to do good to those who do bad things to us. If we don't fight back, then the conflict usually goes away. I've told the story before of the church member who threatened me over the phone about 20 years ago. I was nervous around him, but I kept saying hello to him, kept interacting with him. I would even sit with him at church dinners. I treated his wife and children very well. And while it didn't happen quickly, eventually he came around to apologize. Number three, give a soft answer. This is from Proverbs 15. The final model says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Have you ever had someone really get in your face and holler at you? This model instructs us not to holler back at them, but instead to stay calm and respond softly. This will often diffuse an explosive person, and you can then deal with the issue in question. However, if you respond in kind, the situation will only escalate until a full-blown shouting match or worse. I actually had to use this model recently, and it worked. The person even called back the next day and apologized for their poor behavior. Now, these are not the only ways to respond to difficult people, of course. And in fact, these models may not work with extremely abusive people. Sometimes there are other things we may need to do in addition to these, including ending the relationship altogether. But sometimes you can't do that. You're going to see that difficult coworker at work tomorrow. You're going to see your annoying uncle at Easter. You're going to see that hard-to-get-along-with neighbor today after church. I'm not telling you to be a willing victim of their ugly behavior. But as a Christian, there are three behaviors that make us radically different from the rest of the world. And they are, number one, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Two, we're to even love our enemies. And three, we are to forgive those who have hurt us. That's what Jesus said, and that's what Jesus did. May God bless you as you deal with difficult people this week. And may you recognize the difficulty you might be causing someone else. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, sometimes we just run into people that seem to be ornery, difficult, painful to deal with. Lord, help us to learn how to best deal with prickly people and where we are the ones who are upsetting people around us. Help us to calm down. Help us to be more pleasant, to bear witness to your love, to act like Jesus did, to treat others as we would have them treat us. We ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Every week during Lent, we've given you a special challenge to try to do throughout the coming week. And this week, as uh, we, we talk about um, difficult people, I, I, I'm not so concentrated in my challenge on the difficult ones. I just want you to um, reach out in love to people that 
um, you may not even really know. So our challenge is to treat perfect strangers, especially those who work in a service industry, especially well. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about your, your, um, your hostess, your, your wait, waitress, your um, postal carrier, the person who um, uh, might help you at the grocery store, um, you know, just wherever you go, if you're interacting with a total stranger, okay, um, treat them well. Tip a little more than you usually do. do. Do something in kindness and love for the stranger. All right, that's our challenge. And then, of course, in response to our sermon, as we deal with difficult people, go forth to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.